So today's project is to rebuild this little three-phase motor. This is a two horsepower 3600 RPM three-phase motor. This is actually the spindle motor off of a Chevalier surface grinder. Uh, I salvaged this one off of a machine that was being scrapped and this motor has a special uh, flange. I don't know if it's common in, in uh, other countries but it's hard to find here in the United States and I have another surface grinder that's basically brand new but it's missing its spindle motor so I salvaged this motor off of that that uh, Chevalier that was being scrapped and now I need to rebuild it and basically all I've done at this point is I took off the end caps took the rotor out took the bearings off the rotor disassembled and just cleaned everything uh, I don't know what it is about surface grinders. I guess it's this, the uh, metal dust or the metal slurry, or I don't know, maybe just just a an industry-wide lack of maintenance. But by far, the dirtiest, nastiest machines that I work on are some kind of grinder, and this one's no exception. Yeah, all these cooling fins were just completely caked with God knows what, and uh, yeah, pretty nasty. But this is a TEFC motor, totally enclosed, fan cooled. So, as long as the bearings are intact, essentially the inside of the motor is sealed. And really, the inside didn't look too bad. I took it apart. I had a little surface rust on the inside of this housing. This housing is cast iron, so I think that's to be expected. But I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I took a quick uh, resistance check across each phase, and I had you know two and a half ohms something like that it seemed like it was in the in the realm of being right and then I checked each phase to the housing and it didn't have any continuity on my little multimeter here so that was encouraging so the next thing I did is I, I relabeled all of these leads this is a nine lead motor so it can be wired for for 480 or 240 volts and I took it to my local electric motor shop and for twenty dollars they checked it out with their Megger and hopefully you can read this little card this is the kind of report card that they gave me when I picked it up so they surge tested it it surge tested good they checked the windings with a Megger and a Megger is really just an ohm meter like your multimeter but where your multimeter checks resistance at maybe 5 volts or 10 volts DC the mega checks it at high voltage this one checked at 10,050 volts um, some of them are 250, 500, 1000 volts uh, I assume that they make even bigger ones anyway so it's just a it's just an ohmmeter but it checks resistance at a very high voltage so when they mega motor they're checking the winding the windings to the case and ideally you would have infinite resistance there so no conductivity between the winding and the case you know a brand new motor I'm sure you would have an infinite reading here uh, in this case it read 150 mega ohms so that's 150 mega ohms of, of uh, resistance between the winding and the housing and that's not perfect but that's fine um, you know Various people have various ideas of what's okay, but in my opinion, anything over 20 mega ohms is okay. Obviously, the closer you get to zero, that's more conductivity between the resist the uh, the winding and the housing. So, you know, you can consult with your motor shop about what the what the appropriate threshold would be. But yeah, 20 to 30 mega ohms or more should be fine. And then they I've, they must have checked the uh, each winding's resistance with the with their meter as well and yeah 11 11 11.1 11 so the numbers don't really mean anything what's important is that their the phases are balanced and yeah it seems like it's pretty good so yeah I don't have a mega but you know twenty dollars no big deal and then actually it, I'm sure if they were going to rebuild this motor themselves they would have actually put it in an oven and heated it up to say 120 130 degrees Fahrenheit like 40 degrees Celsius and then they would have they would have megged it again because you know some thermal expansion of the winding or whatever 
could have changed that value. But they just checked it at ambient temperature. And yeah, like I said, 150, that's fine. So now that I have the, the results from the Mega, and it shows that the winding is good, the insulation, this varnish insulation on the on the uh, wire and the in the winding is good, then I feel confident about doing the rest of the rebuild. So it looks like uh, for sure we need new bearings. These are pretty crusty. And then the the biggest problem that I found so far, this is the this is the rear bearing housing. And I don't know how well it's going to show up on camera, but if you can see that little lip right there at the tip of my fingernail, that's uh, that's the edge of a wear pattern. And uh, yeah, this rear bearing is pretty loose inside that inside that journal. So that's not right. Also, it looks to me like. Uh, well, for sure it's been spinning in the journal. Um, I can tell it's been spinning because this is the wavy washer that preloads the rear bearing. And you can see it actually has spun so much. The bearing has spun so much on this wavy washer, it actually wore, the outer race of the bearing actually wore through the wavy washer. So, yeah, that's no good. This bearing should be, I don't know, maybe, maybe two to three tenths sliding fit in this housing. So, yeah, it's probably, I don't know, I bet it's five thousandths right now. So it's way out, and it needs to be, needs to be addressed. Also, uh, I'm seeing some weird patterns on here. I would almost bet, I'd almost bet that the last guy who was in here tried to use some Loctite to fix this. Yeah, that's no good. Loctite can do a lot of good things, but it can't fix a five thousandths slop fit in a bearing journal. No way, no how. And uh, yeah, part of the fun of taking things apart is that you can see, you know, what's happened before. It's all about detective work. And I know that this motor's been apart before because the the nameplate here actually specs the bearings. Uh, there's a 6204 and a 6205. ZZ, which would mean dual shielded bearings, and these are sealed bearings, 2RS series bearings. So, somebody's been in there before. Also, I can see uh, on the outside of this one, I don't know if you can read it, it says NTN USA, and uh, yeah, this is a Taiwanese motor from a Taiwanese machine, so there's no way that it normally or originally would have had USA made bearings. The other thing that's kind of disturbing, this is the rotor. There goes my bearing retainer. Uh, these are the balance lugs on the rotor and they just look fucking terrible. I don't know what happened. Somebody, if somebody beat the crap out of them when they were installing the bearings or if that's how they balanced it or they beat the crap out of it when they when they installed the rotor on the shaft because this is a two piece. Yeah, I don't know. The the front side's not so bad, but the back side looks terrible. So, yeah, I'm probably going to file these little burrs off. I mean, it, sh it shouldn't affect the balance too much. I'm sure it will have some small effect, but yeah, I think it'd be better to have a slightly out of balance rotor than to have you know, a chance of some of these little little corners breaking off and swirling around inside the motor. Um, the other thing I found, this is the cooling fan from the back of the motor and uh, yeah, the hub's broken right here. So that needs to be replaced. It's an 18 millimeter diameter shaft. So while I was at the motor shop, they uh, were kind enough to sell me this and uh, the bore is pretty close. I think it's 5 eighths. So I just need to just need to bore that out to my 18 millimeter, and then uh, we'll be good to go there. So yeah, the big thing to fix right now is this uh, this worn bearing journal, and it's not that big of a deal. All I'm going to do is just I'll just set this up in the lathe, and I'll bore this this journal. 
I don't know, maybe three sixteenths oversize. It's plenty of meat there. And then I'll just make a sleeve that I can press fit into that bore. And then I'll finish bore the inside of the sleeve to the right diameter for that bearing. So I guess that's the next step. Okay, here's the that back bearing bearing cap set up in my in my engine lathe. And this is a bit of a tricky setup because you need to have uh, you need to dial in this lip here and this face and the back side of the part is just a rough casting so you don't have anything to to register off of so it's a little a little time consuming to get that all set up and uh, dialed in and you know I couldn't get it perfect it's within about two and a half thousandths now that'll be good enough what we're doing right now is just it's just roughing really because we care we care about the diameter because we're going to have to press fit this sleeve in but we don't necessarily care about the relationship of this diameter to anything else because once we press the sleeve in we're going to rebore the the inside ID of the sleeve you know in place so it, it's not that critical it'll be it'll be critical at that time when I do the final bore so uh, I'm set up and measured. It's about an inch 850 right now. I'm going to take it out to two inches, and I'm actually going to try to take it out to an inch 998, and that'll give me a two thousandths press fit. Um, yeah, good rule of thumb is a thousandth per inch, and I'd like a heavy press fit, so I'm going to try for two to two and a half thousandths of press fit on this. Uh, on this bore. So I gotta come out 150 thousandths. So let's see how that looks. Okay, so I took a few measurements and uh, I decided to change change the plan a little bit. I'm actually going to go out to two inches fifty thousandths. Uh, I started looking at it and I think that that uh, two inch OD is just going to be too thin to handle on that small on that sleeve. So I don't want to get into any chatter or ringing issues. So I'm at uh, I'm at two inches ten thousandths right now. Okay, I think we did pretty good. Looks like uh, the final bore came out 2.0482. So, yeah, I missed my mark by two tenths. I think we can live with that. So now we'll move on to uh, making the sleeve. And I'll make the sleeve to to two inch fifty thousandths. Maybe, it'll, maybe just a hair 
a hair bigger and that'll give us a nice press fit on that. Okay, this is our sleeve and currently it's measuring about about uh, 24 thousandths oversize. Looks good. Okay, I'm here at the Arbor Press. I'm gonna put this sleeve in. So I uh, put a chamfer on the leading edge and I knocked the sharp edge off of this bore. So it should, uh, should push in there without too much fuss. I'm gonna put a little bit of this red Loctite on it. Just to make myself feel better. Yeah, there's not a lot of times where it's appropriate to use red Loctite, but I think this qualifies. Again, it doesn't need it, but it'll make me feel better. That's it. So tomorrow, I will uh, finish that bore out and fit it to the bang. Okay, so the rotor is cleaned up and I'm ready to assemble these new bearings. So there's the new bearings. These are the, these are the proper uh, shielded bearings for this uh, application. These are uh, what? FAG bearings made in Korea. That should be fine. So uh, these are pretty small bearings. It wouldn't be a big deal to just press those onto the rotor. Uh, but what I'm actually going to do is, is heat them up. And I don't have an induction bearing heater. And even if I did, I don't think I, I could use it because uh, typically the crossbar, the smallest crossbar you can get is like three quarters of an inch. So I, uh, I'm just going to use this little guy here. That's an induction kind of a toaster oven. And uh, that will get us where we need to be. So... Uh, I'm shooting for 200 degrees. That's a good starting point. Uh, it should be fine to go up to about 250 degrees. I wouldn't go much hotter than that. And these are shielded bearings too. I'm not sure uh, how good of luck you would have heating sealed bearings. I think it would be okay, but yeah, I'm not sure. I never tried it. Uh, anyway, I'm going to use this thing here. This is a temperature crayon. And this one is for yeah, 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So, all I'm going to do is, uh, yeah, I'm going to mark the other side. Mm. Nope, this side. Okay, that's it. All we care about is the inner race temperature. And uh, the idea is that this this crayon is a some type of wax and it basically melts at exactly the right temperature so all we need to do is drop this guy in the oven and as soon as the temperature crayon melts we know we're at 200 degrees uh, I also have this contact style thermometer that I can use to double check my my uh, temperature and that works very well and what you don't want to do is you do not want to use an infrared 
temperature gun or thermometer, you know, the fancy little thing with the laser pointer on it. Yeah, that's, that's not a good tool to use in this situation. The reason why is that these bearings are ground to a super shiny finish and shiny surfaces have a very low emissivity. Emissivity is a surface property that determines how well they emit radiation and an infrared temperature sensor basically just measures radiation and uh, yeah the emissivity goes from zero to one and shiny surfaces like this are almost zero so the reading that you get on the on the infrared gun will be far lower than what the bearing temperature actually is so yeah those infrared guns are fine for you know painted surfaces or like you know like this countertop rough textures but they're not good for shiny surfaces okay here they are cooking away and I'm just gonna wait for that little uh, crayon mark to melt and then I'll know that they're at the right temperature we're at the right temperature here goes nothing Voila, that's it. Uh, yeah, as a professional courtesy on ball bearings, I like to install them with the uh, identification numbers facing out, just so that, uh, you know, just to be nice to the next guy, so that it, if he ever has to take the motor apart and he wants to know what the bearings are without taking them off, he can just look at the, look at the race and see what he needs to do. Okay, I think it's time to put this motor back together. <clears throat> as you can see, uh, I went ahead and painted the inside of these end caps on both ends, just you know, so there's there's no surface rust. I actually bead blasted these because they were so so nasty, and took off the original paint on the inside. So I've already finished board this ring. Sorry I didn't film that, but it's a pretty tedious little setup, and uh, I wanted to make sure that I I hit my size exactly right, and without any distractions, that's a lot easier. So, the uh, the bearing is 47 millimeters. That's uh, 1.8504, I believe, inches. And all I did was just bore this bore this ring out to about I don't know four tenths, five tenths undersize, and then I just used some some real fine sandpaper to polish the bore to the exact size that I want. So it's basically now just a tenth or two above the diameter of the bearing so it's a it's a real nice sliding fit on there and that's what we want yeah that that five thousandths you know five thousandths of slop in that journal not gonna work so I think I'm gonna go ahead and put it back together and maybe that would be interesting for people to see I don't know I'm going to go ahead and film it anyway. So, uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is we've got our bearings on. Everything's good there. I've got this bearing retainer. I did remember to put that on. I straightened it a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and uh, assemble the, the front bearing. There we go. And uh, yeah, the, the the outer race of that bearing is just a few, I don't know, maybe 20 thousandths proud of the bearing journal. And that's all that, that that bearing retainer needs to hold that together. So the idea on all these motors is that the front bearing is fixed, the rear bearing floats. So that if you have a, a coupling or pulley or something at the drive end, you want that to be fixed and you want the thermal expansion to be taken up by the back bearing.
and the retainer is just held in by these Phillips head screws, little pan head screws. I'm using a little bit of anti seize just for the sake of the next guy. I find it's always uh, it's always a good idea to take a little extra time and be nice to the next guy because most of the time it's going to be you. Okay, that looks good. Feels good and tight. Now you can see I already have started masking this this uh, stator portion off. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and paint this when I get it assembled. So I didn't have much else to do, so I went ahead and did some masking. It won't interfere with our reassembly process. So, everything's good and clean. Oh, let's pop it together and see. That's it right there. So there's a the new wavy washer. I'm just going to use a little bit of grease. And that'll actually hold that wavy washer in that bearing journal while I assemble the while I assemble the rear cap. So, here we go. Okay, I think that's perfect. I can actually feel that wavy washer pushing the end caps apart slightly. So that's what we want. We want a little bit of preload on that bearing. Yeah, cool. Okay, so I'll just put these tie bolts in. A little bit of uh, anti-seize on those again. Okay, sorry. Uh, I didn't. I had forgotten that these uh, these three lugs are not equally spaced. So they basically idiot proofed it for us, so that we have to put it back together the same way it came apart.
Okay, that's those bolts snugged up. Yeah, everything spins free. So these are these are M6 bolts. So yeah, they don't have to be that tight. I think I'm gonna torque them to about 50 inch pounds, and yeah, that should be plenty. So there's 40. There's 40. All right, there's 60 inch pounds. Yeah, that'll be plenty. There's no reason to to just bear down on those. You know, they don't really do that much. So there it is, all assembled, spinning nice and freely. Time for paint. Okay, here's our motor. I'll put back together, ready to go. I got the wiring set up for 220 volts and yeah got the fan on shroud on and I went ahead and installed this coupling the uh, only thing I was gonna say is that these are these are Lovejoy couplings uh, for real come on for real Lovejoy couplings this is a 19 millimeter for the spindle side that's a 20 millimeter for the motor side but when they came in, uh, they only had a single set screw, this one here, uh, above the key. And, yeah, I don't know if they uh, just cheaped out or what, but I, I like to, or prefer to have at least two set screws. So you have one set screw that holds the key, that's important, and then this set screw holds the shaft. So yeah, this this set screw above the key really doesn't do anything to to hold the location of the coupling. So anyway, these are M6 set screws. So I just drilled and tapped an additional hole for uh, a second set screw. And yeah, this is a small motor, two horsepower. But actually, on on higher horsepower applications, I'll actually uh, run the set screw down and mark the the shaft, and then I'll actually spot drill the shaft so that I get a a, a positive engagement. From the set screw to the shaft just just to make sure the thing doesn't come apart and uh yeah i think uh, we're ready to mount this this bad boy so that'll be the the next part of our video uh unfortunately we got interrupted by that thing right there which is uh, a yaskawa spindle drive out of a cnc lathe and uh she's got a little problem on the braking side so I may have to deal with that before I can finish uh, putting this motor on, but we'll see. Okay, here's the uh, spindle motor installed on the grinder. And uh, yeah, got the wiring all hooked up. So we'll go around the other side and, and uh, see how she works. Here's the grinder. And uh, yeah, I had to wheel it over here where I have some uh, access to power. So. Uh, this is the electrical cabinet and uh, you can see my, my temporary power leads running in here. Uh, that's the main switch. Everything's uh, cranked up. Uh, yeah, if you're working in the industrial, uh, industrial realm, I want to make this connection while the safety guy is on his lunch break. But uh, luckily, I don't have to worry about that here. So. Uh, let's see. That's the go button. Yeah. 
So, sounds pretty good. And uh, I even got lucky and the rotation direction is correct. So, yeah, I think we got a winner. Cool. So I think uh, I'll probably let that run for, uh, I don't know, an hour or so. Make sure everything's okay. Check the temperature now and then. Uh, this grinder, give you a little backstory on this. So this is a uh, this is an Enco surface grinder sold by Enco, now defunct, taken over by MSC and destroyed. Uh, you know, made in China, of course. But I bought this machine from a local high school shop, metal shop, and uh, obviously they bought this machine brand new from Enco and set it up in their shop and never used it and I don't even think that they ever uh, mounted a chuck on it and that's probably the reason why they never used it you know it's really hard to use a surface grinder without the magnetic chuck so anyway uh, the machine sat there in the corner no chuck never run and the teacher retired and a new shop teacher took over and somehow or another he ended up letting the students take the motor off this grinder and take it apart and they took it apart and either couldn't figure out how to put it back together or lost some of the components and basically it was completely useless at that time so they sold this machine as surplus and it was sold to me as brand new but no motor so yeah I know it's a Chinese surface grinder but it's essentially a brand new machine I don't think it's ever ground apart there's no dust on it I actually had to uh, you know scrub off most of the original Cosmoline grease so yeah for a pretty minimal investment I have a a working brand new surface grinder so uh, yeah try to find a chuck for it get it mounted and uh, we'll see you know we'll see what uh, how it works or if I uh, if I want to keep it or, or uh, sell it off the only thing that you know is a bummer about this machine is that it's a manual surface grinder so yeah you gotta do the cranking so I replaced all the uh, all the balls underneath the table so that there's a, a V way and a flat way and it rolls on basically just ball bearings and in the process of transporting it they lost a few or or something so I replaced the balls and I also replaced the cable that uh, basically drives the you know the cable that wraps around the spool and drives the table so uh, yeah but anyway it's a manual surface grinder and uh, yeah that really sucks personally I think they should be illegal it's so easy to automate that side to side motion yeah every surface grinder ought to be hydraulic anyway uh, yeah I think that's a successful project we're gonna put a we're going to wrap it up.